guess who's back? Back again. It's the boys. Boys to Men is a good band. 1999. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Uh, yeah, the, the pod people are back. Uh, I'm Matisse Van Rossum. I'm Ben Sheets. And um, sorry for not releasing an episode last week. If you didn't see our social media posts, it was uh, a bit crazy with scheduling and stuff. Work shit, mostly. But we're back. As promised, and uh, before we get into our main theme, we're going to talk a little bit about some general movie news. Uh, I'm going to talk about movie pass news. news. Um, As we've mentioned before on the program, uh, we use movie pass pretty regularly. It's a, a really nice service for what it costs, but... They have been struggling financially for the last couple of months, like pretty fucking badly. I I think I saw that they had like a monthly deficit of like forty five million dollars, yeah, <laughs> which is insane. And uh, so because of it, they are limiting their service from uh, unlimited films for ten dollars a month to. A mere three movies a month for ten dollars. Um, at least they're not going up in price, but you're certainly not getting as much bang for your buck. It's funny because Movie Pass, for all its uh, financial woes, it is like letting a lot of people see movies they wouldn't otherwise see. In the theaters. Oh, yeah. I've seen on, way more movies from 2018 than I would have otherwise if on, I didn't have movies. On pass. Stupid Rich People's Dime, too. Right. Which is, like, the best part of it. Well, their, their troubles really reached ahead with uh, Mission Impossible and Mamma Mia coming out the same weekend. <laughs> and they lost so so much money from everybody going to see those big movies that they literally had to shut down their service for a couple of days. Like when we went to see Unfriended and the service was down and now they're like, oh, well, we're not going to offer, you know, free tickets for like big opening weekend movies, you know, trying to backpedal a little bit. And then they're just like, well, if you want us to still be a company, we, we got to do something yeah. different they're they're owned by this company helios matheson analytics and i was looking at the stock prices for Helio, helios matheson and literally last year around august september this company had a stock price of like eighty three hundred dollars what do you think its stock price is right now oh god i could not even begin to guess not good <laughs> Five cents. Five cents? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, just for shits and giggles, I, uh, I have a Robinhood account, which is like you can buy stocks for free. Well, I mean, you have to pay for them, but there's no additional fees to buy them. Did you buy stocks? I Helios bought Matheson? $15 worth of Helios Matheson when it was six cents. Just uh, for the possibility of them either selling Movie Pass and going back up, or Movie Pass actually succeeding, starting to make money. Um, it's a long shot, but I thought, fuck it, fifteen bucks—that's nothing. I mean, I I legitimately love Movie Pass. Like, I think it's a fantastic service, but I'm not at all surprised that they're doing as badly as they are the, based on their business model. Yeah, because the, like. The the price of ten dollars a month for unlimited movies, like it pays for itself like after a movie. Like movie pri- movie tickets, like cheap movie tickets these days are like eight fifty. So if you go see more than one movie a month with movie pass, like you're absolutely getting your money's worth. More so. Yeah. And we've been going to see a lot more movies than that. Yeah. Well the funniest thing about buying the the stocks was uh literally two days after I bought it, Rob, uh Robin Hood announced that you could no longer buy Helios Matheson stocks on their app. Probably because it was consistently because... trading under ten cents. Oh yeah. I can still sell it, but I can't buy anymore. 
um, which I find really funny. But I think now that the cat is out of the bag, so to speak, with movie pass showing the true value of movies in the eyes of consumers, I think we're going to have a situation somewhat akin to when the internet kind of affected print journalism in a way where I think people will start to realize like the true value of movies in their own heads is much less than what they're paying yeah. at the theaters and it'll kind of accelerate the downfall of theaters I guess yeah I, I could see that I I think that for, if it goes away, if it goes away for sure, yeah. Because I think that in a lot of ways, like Movie Pass and similar other services, like we now have the new AMC one, where for twenty dollars a month you can see three movies a week at any AMC theater, um, stuff like that. Like that is the direction that we need to go in to save theaters. Like, honestly, like, I love going to see movies on the big screen. Like, it's definitely a totally different experience than watching a movie at home. But, like, the ticket prices and having to deal with shitty people and having to sneak in your own booze instead of just openly bringing in your own booze is, like, you know, it's a hassle. And... Like, movie theaters for a long time now have been like, what do we need to do to make people go to the movies? And it's like, well, you either change your business model or something like Movie Pass comes along and makes it actually worth it going to see movies in theaters. It's a tricky position they're in. But, you know, honestly, tentpole big budget movies are thriving more than ever today. For sure. Because the international market is bigger than ever, especially places like China. Yes. You know, places even in Europe. Well, to the and we've talked about this on the podcast before, but to the extent that American production studios are creating movies specifically that will do well in foreign markets even if they won't do well in the US shit like the World of Warcraft movie, the Transformers movies, uh, that Great Wall movie with Matt Damon. I bet... Or was that Mark Wahlberg? Matt Damon, right? I think it was Matt Damon, yeah. Um, Um, Like, stuff like that where companies are like, well, we'll put a shitload of money into making these absolutely terrible movies, and who cares if they bomb domestically because they're gonna fucking sweep in countries like China, that's been re- like dramatically changing the industry over the last decade or so, two decades. Well, yeah, and the thing is, you see more reliance on action set pieces where they don't need subtitles. Exactly. You know, that goes throughout the whole movie, it feels like, at times. Well, because the uh, the American film industry has more money than any other film industry in the world. So that's the thing about movies like that where there's very little dialogue and it's just nonstop action with really good effects is that for foreign markets, they eat that shit up because they don't have to read the subtitles, but they're getting a chance to see special effects that they're not accustomed to seeing from their own film industries so like it's exciting and different for them whereas we have such an oversaturation of that in this country that for you know the the less dumb american audiences like that shit is just frustrating Well, and I also think it's kind of an American exceptionalist condescension towards the international markets. I think a lot of times when a movie is good, people will go see it even if they have to read subtitles. For sure. You know, or if it's dubbed, like, people will deal with that if it's a good movie. Yeah, but I still think, I I agree with you, but I still think that that audience is the minority, because even if you look at the reverse of it in America, like, how many people do you know who 
don't want to watch foreign films because they don't want to read the subtitles. Like that's, I hate that excuse. It's the lamest shit ever. Like there are so many yeah, good foreign movies. Yeah, but at the movies. same time, you know, in a lot of those areas, they're also dubbed. Uh, know, yeah, that's true. That's true. Subtitles. No, no, no. That's that is very um, true. So like, if you have a movie that's good, and the biggest way you can usually tell is looking at the drop off in numbers first weekend to second weekend or even throughout the weekend because word of mouth is one of the strongest deciders absolutely of, of movie success but yeah i think i think we're still in an early stage of kind of exploring this new market and kind of this condescension towards kind of shoehorning I, I almost want to say international fan service i guess you could say in yeah. a way where like they're forcing these big set pieces because they think that's what people want and in the last like decade or two i've noticed a lot of more uh, representation of asian people in movies which is good but a lot of times they are stereotypical portrayals of asian yeah. people mm -hmm. which kind of backfires against the whole point of their inclusion yeah um it's obvious especially in action movies well yeah and it's obvious they're used to connect with the foreign market but if they're used in such a dumbed down colonialist way like it's almost doing them self a disservice i i would agree with you absolutely that being said it's obviously working or they wouldn't be putting so much time and effort into it it's working in the short term yeah i think i think an oversaturation is gonna eventually burn it out but when a movie like world of warcraft can like make over a hundred million dollars internationally while totally fucking bombing in the country that it was produced in like that you know they're they don't care where the money's coming from as long as the money is there and i wouldn't be surprised if we see a sequel to that world of warcraft movie in the next couple of years regardless of how it did in the u.s but because it was so successful in asia well yeah but that's because they're they're all gamers there <laughs> I mean, yeah, for sure. Like, like, that's the biggest reason why Warcraft succeeded. It wasn't because of the set pieces. It was because of the name recognition. To an extent, I, th I think you're right. But, like, I think the set pieces and the effects, like, do have something to do with it. Because, like, the Transformers movies do the same thing. They keep making these movies that just get longer and longer and worse and worse but it doesn't stop we're what like six five or six transformers movies in at this point getting with a like spinoff at this point yeah we're getting a spinoff this year there's like another two or three non-spinoff movies in the franchise uh you know coming out within the next few years it's like the fact that these movies are still so fucking successful despite being so critically panned is like yeah they're only making their money on these movies off of foreign audiences because even the the uneducated mass u.s audiences are no longer buying that shit like i don't even know stupid people who still get excited for transformers movies no like and that, that's saying something you know like i fucking watched the first three i should have stopped after the first one but they at least had me going for a little while i don't even know if i watched the third one oh, it's they're trash. they're all garbage Tra though. they're all no they all suck. um the first one's okay at best but they all suck really yeah uh yeah well i think uh there is a good point there about action set pieces uh, this is a tangent but did you see that michael bay is producing a live action uh door the explorer movie where door is like a teenager in it oh my god i saw this great twitter post where someone was like exclusive behind the scenes photo of uh the new door the explorer movie and uh it was like 
the the girl who's playing Dora the Explorer with like the the black casting couch, the in porn the back. casting couch. Yeah, I saw that too. I didn't. I very good. I didn't know that Michael Bay was producing. Yeah, that. because that's, of course, <sighs> that's fucking wild. Um, oh my god. I mm, well, there's one other bit of news I want to talk about, and that is. Uh, in the past week or so, uh, the Oscars have announced oh, fuck yeah. that they are uh, adding a new category to the awards, and that's Best Blockbuster or Most, most popular, popular Picture, film, something like that, yes. What I want to talk about specifically with it is, do you think its inclusion may be a good thing for horror and genre focused films because i <sighs> the cynic in me wants to say that this is just a cheap play by disney to elevate this is for marvel the, and star wars yeah movies. they're 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 tentpole movies even further and just further emphasize their stranglehold on nearly 40 percent of the film market at this point yeah i think i think it's that because the thing about movies like uh like marvel's marvel films or uh star wars films is that at the oscars the best those movies will do is uh for uh makeup and hair or uh visual effects yeah one of those movies is at least always nominated even if it doesn't win last year 2017 oscars fucking suicide squad won best hair and makeup and so they can officially say roby though I, i have um but that means that they can officially say that suicide squad is an oscar winning film i mean so is norbit Yes, for the same reason, <laughs> but for the same reason, yes, though, yes. and I think that now introducing this uh, most popular picture category is just an extension of that, because that category is I guaranteed going to be dominated by superhero films and Star Wars films. Well, just to be the contrarian for a second, hair and makeup, you know, like, you don't have to have a good movie to have good hair and makeup. No, that's absolutely true. And that's true. one of the biggest reasons why garbage like Norbit or Suicide Squad win because they do legitimately For have sure. craft and artifice to their hair and makeup even though the rest of the movie is pretty garbage. But and to but- be a bit of an optimist towards this new category even though the cynic in me wants to automatically say this is just a marketing ploy. The optimist in me says, you know, like the Oscars always trend towards a specific type of movie to win most of their awards. Right. That's the the whole reason there's, you know, the the concept of Oscar bait. Biopics, historical, war films, political a pr- a pretty, tinged things. A pretty actor making themselves look ugly. Quote unquote woke films yeah. there is in almost uniform exclusion of anything old people would consider lowbrow too um you rarely see comedies get nominated for best picture um you almost never see horror movies get nominated for best picture yeah, this last year was uh, a pretty big exception for that. Yeah. Um, which was nice. It was refreshing, I must say. Yeah. Despite the fact that, I mean, it didn't super pay off. Get Out got Best Original Screenplay, which is a big fucking deal. And, you know, even even superhero movies, you know, like they are, in a lot of ways, lowbrow genre films. And, like, even though I'm full-on superhero fatigue at this point and just cannot care about superhero movies in any form right now. There are good superhero movies to come out and they deserve recognition just as much as your Moonlight or your Whiplash or your Birdman, 
you know? So is your thought that this new Oscar category is essentially going to serve as a quote unquote Oscar bait category that will leave other categories more open for uh, films that are less likely to be recognized by drawing some of the attention into a different category? I w- In a way, I would say the new blockbuster most popular film is the best way to sum it up is a lowbrow best film category a populist best film i mean for sure like that's literally what it is yeah and but i I still i still think think it's only gonna be super i still think it's only gonna be superhero films and star wars films though most likely yes because we're because we're at the point now where we get uh you know four to five marvel films a year and now sony is even saying that contingent upon venom doing good in october they're going to be reigniting their own marvel franchise within the properties that sony still owns um, it, it's, I, it's called something really stupid, but the one- like characters of the Marvel cinematic un Sony's characters of Marvel universe or something like that. Ugh, that sounds convoluted. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Very confusing. But the one thing I will say is the thing that makes me slightly less cynical about it is it's probably, I don't a hundred percent know with certainty on this. But I'm pretty sure this will be voted on in the same way everything else by the Academy is. And because it's voted on, even though they're making strides, they're still in a lot of ways crotchety. For sure. The crotchety Academy is voting on these. We might get some interesting films nominated that they don't think are classy enough for Best Picture nominated but will they win i mean it is still voted on by the academy you know yeah for sure and i see where you're going with that i think i think regardless it's going to be at least good films that win i don't think bad films are going to win just because they're popular i Uh, think i think people will have to like them for a okay uh, to be nominated here here now i'll play the contrarian uh this is something they're gonna implement in the the 2019 oscars yeah i believe so I'm okay not 100% sure. um i would bet a large sum of money that infinity war is gonna win that this the is gonna win the first one and infinity war is not a good movie I I would probably be tarred and feathered in the streets if I said that around the wrong people, but Infinity War is not a good movie. And if we're getting the first most popular film nomination at the Academy Awards in 2019, it's gonna Infinity War is gonna win. Infinity War or Black Panther? I think it would be Black Panther, honestly. I mean, I would and be honestly, I would be happier if it was Black yeah, Panther because I think honestly, Black Panther is a, a way, decent film. Black Panther, I think, deserves it deserves the it recognition more. for sure. You know, not because it's not popular, but because but it's going to be Infinity War because it's I got no because it got though. it's got Black Panther in it. It's got all your favorite Marvel characters, and it's emotional at the end because they all die because Thanos snaps his fingers and then they're all dead, and but it makes the little the same kids time, cry. I don't know if that that's going to be the case though, because look at the how hard the Academy has been trying in the past few years to be performatively woke. And because of that, I think Black Panther has better odds than uh, most. We'll see. I I think if Black Panther didn't come out the same year as Infinity War, I would agree with you. But I think I think Infinity War is going to sweep that category. We'll revisit this uh, after the Oscars in 2019, and we'll look back to this episode and see who was right. But I'm I'm placing my bet now in August of 2018 that Infinity War is going to sweep that category. Well, just for just for the sake of uh sake of fun, let's guess what will be nominated. 
So we got Infinity War, we got Black Panther. Those are basically shoe ins. Uh, um, new Mission Impossible, probably. It did very well opening weekend. Yes. Um, what else even um, came out this year? See, I feel like this is. I'm a bad person to jump in on this because I don't watch the most popular films most of the time because I expect them to be bad. This has kind of been a weird year for yeah. popular movies. Normally, I would say obviously the Star Wars film, Incredibles but Solo two. Solo did really bad. Incredibles two, maybe, which I would be most on board with because I loved Incredibles two. Incredibles 2 is in a weird position where I think it fits in that kind of what I was saying, lowbrow populist film category where like I think the crotchety Oscar Academy would be like, this can't be best picture. It's a superhero movie. But Incredibles 2 could do it, I think. But I also think Incredibles 2 is for sure going to be up for best animated film. Yes, and I think we'll like. I think we'll likely true. win. Well, let's see. In terms of just looking at the highest grossing films of 2018 so far, we've got the three films we've listed: Black Panther, Infinity War, and Incredibles. Uh, Jurassic World is also up there. Deadpool two is also up there. I don't think Deadpool will win. Uh, honestly, I don't even think it'll be nominated. Hard R rating. For something like most popular film. If it was the first one, it would. But I don't think the second one, because it's just more the same. Uh, Jumanji might be nominated, will not win. I mean, Jumanji came out 2017. I feel like that's too old for 2019. When in 2017 did it come out? Because it, it is listed in the highest grossing films of 2018. It came out like November, December. Uh, well, sometimes that shit'll squeak in, but, yeah, you could be right. Uh, Mission Impossible, A Quiet Place did very well. Uh, Honestly, I I don't think it'll win. I could see it being nominated. Yeah, and that's, you know, what I was going back to, to bring this all around a little bit. I think movies like A Quiet Place, where it's, like, a little too popcorn-y for Best Picture... I think it has a very good chance for well, being quiet, nominated. For nominated, a, maybe. Quiet Place won't win because nobody talks in the movie. Um, but I, I could see it being nominated. I could, honestly, I could see a Quiet Place being nominated for a couple of things. But I, the likelihood of it winning anything, I think, is is pretty low. But only time will tell. Um, it'll definitely be interesting to see the oscars in 2019 and see what's gonna what's gonna go down although like really fuck the academy i'm hoping we get an extended dance sequence of han solo dancing to i'm solo (laughs) i'm han solo i hate that i hate that i hate that so much solo solo (laughs) <laughs> all right well that'll bring us to the end of our news uh segment we went a little bit long on this one but now we're gonna jump into our theme for the week we're stepping back into our time machine uh last time we went to the year 1974 and this time we're bringing you back Almost 20 years to the year 1999, I was six years old, and 9-11 hadn't happened yet. Y2K was on the horizon. Yeah, well... It, Everybody was a scared. That's one thing I want to kind of talk about with all three of these movies, is kind of looking at them a little bit from a historical perspective, because this was near the end of the Clinton era. This was, you know, right around the time the 2000 elections were going on. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uncertainty as to what the future held between the the tech boom and uh, the elections and the Gulf and uh, kind of these hyper-capitalistic tendencies of the country. But yeah, and I think all 
all of that reflects in all three of these movies in a different way. Um, yeah, I would I would say so. We we decided to uh, somewhat issue the uh, more popular horror films of 1999 and go. I wouldn't say totally obscure, Some but deeper cuts. A little bit deeper cuts. Uh, we ignored stuff like the Blair Witch Project, uh, honestly, because that one is deserving of its own episode. I think uh, the Sixth Sense, uh, Deep Blue Sea. Um, sort of brushed past some of those, and we, yeah, decided to focus on slightly deeper cuts. The first film we're going to be talking about is called Stir of Echoes, starring Kevin Bacon, and this is honestly a film that I had never even heard of until uh, we decided to do it for the show. Well, it's interesting. It came out in 99, right around the same time, Within a month of Sixth Sense. Yeah, it, it kind of goes along with that really bizarre film trend where two very similar films will come out around the same time and one will be vastly more successful or more enduring than the other and that other will kind of slip into obscurity a little bit like it happens a, a surprising amount and like you and i noticed the similarities between the sixth sense and stir of echoes like almost immediately they're pretty large parallels yes they're um. both about people with like psychic abilities to see and commune with dead people uh there's uh, a a young child who sees dead people there's sort of a, a a mystery aspect to it um yeah i i would honestly for me uh stir of echoes was very much like uh the Sixth Sense meets The Shining. I think there were definitely a lot of uh, similarities with The Shining as well. Yeah, definitely. I can totally see that comparison. The biggest difference is this movie is a little schlockier and campier, um, mostly thanks to Kevin Bacon's very over-the-top performance. Yeah, this movie is really over-the-top in a lot of ways, but Kevin Bacon kind of goes almost the like Nick Cage route and just takes his insanity to like the next level, to, to almost comic levels at, at certain points. Like, kind of fucking funny. Yet this movie still manages to be, in my opinion at least, pretty successfully tense. Like the the I found the mystery uh pretty engaging and some of the scenes pretty uncomfortable in a good way. Oh absolutely. I the most uncomfortable sequence to me was uh when they had like a a quick like tableau almost of like someone like ripping their fingernail off. Oh yeah. Like, and like Kevin Bacon, like standing in front of the mirror and like pulling one of his teeth out. Yeah. Like, that kind of shit always gets me. Like I'm not disturbed by much, but like teeth being pulled out is a Yeah. Big where thing it's for not me. like insanely gory, but it's just so visceral and disturbing that it stuck with me more than a lot of other things do in horror movies, which is a big plus in its respect, you know, like to get me to like curl up like that. Yeah. And, like, retract in such a way like is something not a lot of films can do. Yeah, it uh, the film revolves around Kevin Bacon and his wife and his young son, um, they've recently moved into a new house, and their little boy starts 
uh, like communing with someone who isn't there, like a ghost, and kind of freaking his parents out. And then at a party, Kevin Bacon lets his sister in law, who is like a Wiccan or something, uh, hypnotize him. And after that, he also starts to see this same uh, dead girl that his son has been seeing and sort of starts to obsess around the events of her death and try to figure out why she's appearing to them and and why they're sort of being haunted and what happened to her. So in that sense, it's it's very, very much like The Sixth Sense. But also, it's kind of got this uh, this aspect of The Shining, where there's like this inherited sort of psychic ability um, that's shared between Kevin Bacon and his son. I almost think I like this movie better than The Sixth Sense. The Sixth Sense is a solid film and definitely one of M. Night Shyamalan's best, although that's not a particularly high bar. I really enjoy the, like we talked about earlier, the sort of over-the-top aspects of it. I think Kevin Bacon's character is way more interesting than Bruce Willis's character in The Sixth Sense. Yeah, I would agree. And I think uh, the schlockiness works with the material a little bit better. I think The Sixth Sense is a very good movie because it's very atmospheric. Um, which this movie does to an extent, I think you get sequences like the original hypnotist sequence where oh, yeah. he's I thought that in was really the cool movie too. theater kind of elevated on his chair, like floating towards the screen. It's very, it's very surreal. That sequence in particular, uh, felt sort of like, uh, like a diet David Lynch sequence, like, not as far out as something David Lynch would do, but inspired by Lynch to sort of have uh, us hearing the hypnotist's voice describing, like, what he's seeing and experiencing, but then we also see it as well, like, we're inside his mind, and I think that that's really effective. I think this movie is also more focused than The Sixth Sense, because it, instead of revolving around, you know, someone just seeing dead people in general, it's like, okay, there's this one dead girl, she keeps showing up, she obviously wants something, she was killed, what happened to her, and then Kevin Bacon becomes, like, completely obsessed uh, to the point of mania with trying to figure this out. Because there's also that, that dynamic of... Like, it's mentioned early on that, like, he he plays in, like, a rock band with his friends or something, and he's always been trying to, like, be famous, but he's got that uh, sort of existential fear of being ordinary and not, you know, not being somebody, and then once he discovers this uh, ability to see dead people or whatever, he becomes obsessed with solving this girl's murder because it's gonna make him great it feels like finally his life has a purpose and he's not just like an average joe and i really really liked that aspect of it it made his mania believable we even get the scene with him arguing with his wife where he's basically like this is the most important thing i've ever done you don't fucking understand this like when he's digging up the whole backyard and he's just gone absolutely crazy trying to find the this dead dead girl's body yeah no i th- I thought that stuff was really good i think having a through line of this kind of murder mystery uh was really to its benefit yeah um it helped kind of focus the narrative in a lot of really productive ways i will say though one of the negatives i have on it is i feel like they don't quite stick the landing a hundred percent you think so yeah because uh they have this this mystery that unfolds and i guess my biggest problem with the third act was like it goes by too quickly i would say 
You think all the from the, the reveal happens yeah, too from fast? the discovery of what happens to suddenly everyone knows and they're all ready to try to kill Kevin Bacon. It feels a little too abrupt. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree. Because, like, it gets to the point where, you know, the people in the neighborhood sort of know that something is up with him. Like, he he's, like, digging up his entire backyard, and then he goes and, like, rents a jackhammer to start digging up the basement. And the guy that he's renting the house from, who lives across the street, can, like, hear the construction and whatever. And he's been asking all of these questions about this girl who went missing several months ago. And it's revealed that, like, a couple of the the neighborhood teenagers, like, tried to rape this girl in the house when it was empty and then killed her accidentally and their dads covered it up one of whom is the guy that he's that Kevin Bacon is renting the house from so when he's starting you know to like really like tear up the house trying to find stuff like they know something is amiss so it didn't really come across as too abrupt to me when they like show up at his house like right after he's finally found the body well it, it, less of that and more that they uh, immediately went to try to kill him like, i mean i suppose so i i think it just felt a little sloppy in a murder mystery that took its time so much to develop i would say because like we don't really completely understand what's going on until ways into the movie. Yeah, I and I, I, I would even say we don't really have too many hints on who the culprit is. Until no, not that, at all. That flashback, not at all. And I almost wish they would have sprinkled a few more hints in there. Um, not in like a ham-fisted way or anything, but even in murder mysteries, you know, you get hints that could point towards characters or other characters, or I, even red herrings. That I think, I, I, and I feel like since this one directly just immediately shot its load off with the flashback, like a little bit of that was stripped from it. In this case, I think I would actually disagree. In most murder mysteries, I would say, yeah, you know, we've got to have the red herrings, we got to have the false leads, stuff like that. Like, because part of the the satisfaction of watching a murder mystery is that you're trying to solve the case along with the detective or whatever. But in this instance, like, you know, Kevin Bacon is our protagonist. It's all from his perspective, and he doesn't know what the fuck is going on. He only knows that there is something going on. And kind of like that obscurity where he's desperate to uncover the mystery, even though he has virtually no leads, I kind of like us also being kept in the dark until all is revealed. I I will agree that him like touching the dead girl's corpse and like absorbing the flashback so he immediately knows exactly what happened could be kind of disappointing, but I like that in a film that's relatively slow uh that you know, at a certain point, like the action just goes from zero to a hundred and all of this stuff is happening all of a sudden. I mean, I, I feel like I, I like that, like it escalated, but I wish there was a buildup in tension. More. You know, I, now that I'm thinking back on it, there is somewhat of of an indication into what's going on when he goes into his house and he has the the vision or whatever of like one of his neighbors being in the house and being like I have to kill you and your wife now this is a decent neighborhood blah 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 and then you know he snaps out of it and that's a vision so we know that there's something going on with the neighbor well, yeah, and, and then that that repeats itself at the end. It was like he was having a, a premonition of yeah, what and, was to and come. That's not to say like the whole the the movie isn't void of tension either, because like there's that 
really good scene of the other kid shooting himself. Yeah. In the middle of it, where, like, that scene is incredibly tense. And I thought that scene was actually, like, pretty disturbing. I would agree, except for the one part that really made me laugh when he has the gun and Kevin Bacon is like, oh, man, like, guns make me uncomfortable or whatever. And the kid's just like, oh, yeah, that makes you uncomfortable? Well, how uh, how about this? And then he just puts the gun to his head and shoots himself. (laughs) I I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, it's done in a very campy way. Um, but you know, the sort of a little bit of that schlocky levity, I think, is is nice. And the fact that this movie is able to find a good balance between like legitimate tension and also that schlockiness is really nice. And I think kind of rare. It's usually one or the other. You know, a film yeah, is I'd either. Agree you know, very serious and straightforward or it's really over the top and fun. And this, this film struck a really interesting balance. It was written and directed by one of the guys who wrote Jurassic Park, uh, and, uh, the, the first mission impossible, uh, which I thought was interesting. So like this dude, obviously, you know, has some has some chops in the film industry and has worked on good, successful films. So I I, I found that kind of interesting and also a little bit weird that this film was so like brushed under the rug to the extent that I had never even heard of it. And I think that has a lot to do with being released within a month of the sixth sense. Absolutely a victim of timing. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think so. Like I, I, I feel like if the sixth sense had been released a couple of years before or after this, then Stir of Echoes would definitely have uh, a much more lasting impression in film because I think it's a good movie. It, like I said, I think I enjoy it more than The Sixth Sense, which which is a good film, but I I think this film is is more interesting than The Sixth Sense. That being said, also like The Sixth Sense is so well known and like everybody knows the twist, and I didn't even see The Sixth Sense until a couple of years ago for the first time, and at that point it's so ingrained in culture that the twist is not effective anymore yeah, because I mean, everybody knows it yeah. at this point. Everybody knows that Bruce Willis is a ghost the whole time, so it doesn't have that that same effect, and Stir of Echoes doesn't have that same sort of twist you know not not to the same intensity i think yeah um but i i do think it's a very solid film and i enjoyed it quite a bit yeah just throw a rating on the end of the I yeah think we've um, kind of come full circle there i think i think i would give stir of echoes a solid four out of five i thought it was a, a really solid film uh good cast good acting well written entertaining at times because of its schlockiness uh, I like Kevin Bacon a lot as an actor, and in this he he goes, uh, you know, full Nick Cage at times uh, to really, you know, interesting, fun effect, but it's still a legitimately tense, creepy, uh, unnerving movie at at plenty of times, and I, I think it's pretty successful all around. So yeah, four out of five for me. Yeah, I would probably give this, uh, well, you know what, let me talk about it a little bit more i think it is a very criminally underrated movie just because it's so overlooked in the shadow of the sixth sense um i think it does a lot of really cool interesting things that the sixth sense doesn't even touch on uh namely you know like the uh dreaminess uh of its surreal moments and uh the visceral feeling of you know some of the more disturbing scenes in the movie um its mystery is pretty well handled too i think it kind of flounders a little bit in the third act just because how abrupt it is in its shift uh namely with the flashback um, that being said, it's very well shot. Kevin Bacon is awesome in it. And yeah, I, w- I would recommend seeing it. I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five. 
Um, definitely worth checking out, though. Solid. Um, that'll give Stir of Echoes an average rating of 3.8 out of 5 pods. Uh, Bef- definitely worth checking out. Um, Before we move on, yeah. uh, I don't know if this is going to be an official segment or not, uh, but as I am extremely online all the time, 24-7, <laughs> Uh, I came across this website called meanstars.com. And what it is, is it compiles anecdotes that people submit about meeting movie stars. Um, Usually they're about celebrities being shitty. I came across this one about Kevin Bacon that is particularly good. (laughs) And I can't excited. I can't not share this. Okay. So it's called. I was a dick to Kevin Bacon. (laughs) Okay. The first time I was a complete dick to him. The first time. (laughs) It was at a little bar in Florida when his band, the Bacon Brothers, were playing. (laughs) I didn't know that was a thing. (laughs) Isn't that very good? Fantastic. I was drunk in college and sitting in the front row. I kept shouting, Play Footloose. Play Footloose. (laughs) Over and over again. (laughs) Didn't matter that it wasn't his song. I wanted to hear Footloose. Needless to say, I didn't get to meet him. (laughs) And I didn't get to hear Footloose. (laughs) Just wait, it gets better. Oh my god. Fast forward several years, and I was working Footloose the Musical (laughs) Tour. (laughs) Okay. We played Thousand Oaks, California for a week, and guess who stopped by? Oh no. That's right, Kevin Bacon. I made it through the show and head back to the LX racks to power down when Kevin Bacon comes backstage to meet the crew. So the whole time I'm slinking around backstage trying not to be seen, he's on stage shaking hands and talking to people when he sees me, does a double take, and then points at me and says, You! I know you! You're a dick! (laughs) <laughs> Needless to say, my entire crew is stunned into odd silence while I apologize all over myself while trying to get out of the building. A bit later on, I was standing on the loading dock when Kevin Bacon came outside. Oh my god. <laughs> he stood next to me and said, Dude, that wasn't cool. I apologized again in earnest, and he seemed to accept that. When he left, he said, By the way, I don't even know the song. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I have some insane street cred with that crew. <laughs> and the rating he gave was okay. <laughs> Holy fuck. <laughs> There's so many elements to oh unpack with the story. <laughs> I love the absolute <laughs> shit out of that. That's one of the greatest stories <laughs> I've ever heard. The Bacon Brothers. The Bacon Brothers. <laughs> oh my Legend. god. Legend. Uh, yeah, but that was uh, that was the uh, primo story I have. Fuck yes, that was a very very good story. All right, so the next film we're going to be talking about tonight is Ravenous, not to be confused with the French-Canadian Ravenous that we talked about a few months ago that we unanimously hated, but um, a lesser-known Ravenous, uh, much better, much better, uh, from 1999, starring Guy Pearce, 
you'd wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the turbulent production of this movie. I think that's a good way to start. Ravenous is a period piece uh, set during the uh, Mexican-American War. Uh, it is a cannibal flick. Uh, and, uh, just the fact that we see a period cannibal piece is, uh, I think sort of unusual and refreshing in and of its own right. It is, uh, directed by Antonia Bird officially, but yes. that sort of segues into what you had wanted to talk yeah, about. So, uh, there was a lot of, uh, problems with the production of this movie it was infamously meddled with by Hollywood producers. Uh, the original director was uh, Milcho uh, Manchevsky, who's a Macedonian art house dude who uh, the year before had directed uh, this movie Before the Rain, which was nominated for an Oscar and had a lot of big buzz about it so he's going into ravenous with a lot of acclaim behind him but the studio kept trying to micromanage details of the movie manchevsky was fired like um, two weeks into the production or something yep. like that uh he was replaced uh by raja gaznell who had one feature credit before Ravenous, and that was for Home Alone 3. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rough. surprisingly, surprisingly. The, the, the cast wasn't too keen on the this, this shift from art house acclaimed filmmaker auteur dude to, to Home Alone 3. Mr. Home Alone 3. So they, they uh, rejected the new director... And refused to work with him. And uh, Robert Carlyle, who uh, is one of the lead actors of this movie, recommended its final director. Antonia uh, Bird. Yep. Uh, who had only done mainly British TV movies. Um, but the end result, as we'll discuss, surprisingly good. Yeah, I had always heard good things about this movie. It's been on my watch list for a long time, and this was my excuse to finally see it. Uh, and I'm glad I finally did. It can definitely be considered a black comedy. It's much funnier than I thought. I went into this movie expecting a very serious film, and it is sort of unabashed in its comedic tone, which I think is ultimately to its credit. I feel like it gets less funny throughout the film. It gets much more serious uh, in the second and third act. But the first act is pretty funny in a lot of ways. Um, it uh, revolves around Guy Pierce, who is uh, a captain in the army, uh, who is sort of uh, not not dishonorably discharged, but uh, removed from his unit because of cowardice and uh, placed in this uh, like outpost in California um, to sort of just like sit there and do nothing. Because during his, his stint in the Mexican-American War, he, uh, fearing for his life, laid down and pretended to be dead and escaped by literally traveling in a cart full of corpses. But well, and then he did go on to attack yes, the he, enemy base from the inside because they thought because he they dead. thought he was dead he had a spurt of courage and took over the enemy base which is why he was promoted to captain but when it was discovered how he went about that uh, he was punished for his cowardice so we've got this sort of uh, craven uh, pussy Guy Pierce character who just sort of ends up getting shipped off west to you know just bide his time and do nothing and uh one night in in this camp a mysterious stranger shows up uh on the verge of death 
and tells a story about how his party became lost in the mountains and had to resort to cannibalism to stay alive. And that's sort of the uh, inciting incident for the rest of the action in the film as they put together a search party to go out and try to find the the remaining members of uh, of this doomed party. Elements of it seem to be heavily inspired by like the Donner Party. Yes. Especially based on the time period it's set in. Um, which which the writers admit uh, yes. it, it is loosely based on, on the Donner Party. Um, but one of the big things that they do a little differently in this movie is they have a concept of if you eat another human... It builds a demonic force within you? Yes, it's based on the uh, Native American legend of the Wendigo, uh, which is something that I've always found uh, kind of interesting, that uh, uh, a warrior would eat the, the flesh of his fallen enemy and gain his strength and power because of it but in return he would become a demon that was possessed by an unquenchable hunger for human flesh and that he would just have to eat other people endlessly never being satisfied um which i think is a very cool mythology that i think is underexplored uh um <clears throat> In horror, we've we've got this element of um, sort of becoming superhuman from the act of eating human flesh. Uh, we discover halfway through the film that the stranger who shows up at their party um, is actually the colonel of the party, Colonel Ives, and that he is the the last surviving member who has eaten his whole party and lured all of these people out here so he can kill and eat them as well to uh, continue to become stronger. I love that transition because in the first half they do set it up really well where you believe that there is this colonel out there somewhere. Yeah. Like feral in the <clears throat> caves. Um, and then they do the switcheroo. Robert Carlyle's character almost becomes this superhuman entity um, who just refuses to be killed. Yeah, and Robert Carlyle is fucking great in this. Yes, he's very he's good. He's really, really good. Um, yeah, that that switch between him being sort of like the traumatized victim and then revealing himself to actually be the colonel and this whole thing to be a trap and he's the mastermind is really cool. The whole search party ends up being killed by him except for Guy Pierce who in a great scene when he's got his back against a cliff and Robert Carlyle is coming for him in his cowardice literally jumps off of the cliff to escape Robert Carlyle and survives by uh, ultimately when he's trapped in a hole in the ground, eating the corpse of one of his uh, companions and taking on his strength and being able to escape, which I think is a great twist that even though he knows the at this point the consequences of eating human flesh, he's so afraid of dying that he's willing to do it just to preserve his own life. And then it leads to uh, eventually a confrontation between these two Wendigos having to fight each other. I, I thought that was all great. I, I love that after that point when he makes his way back to the camp and he, you know, uh, uh, sends a letter for the general or whatever and they show up and they bring with them a new colonel to sort of take command of this post, and it's revealed to be uh, Robert Carlyle, uh, who has, you know, dropped the facade. So then, like, the second half of the film is, like, Guy Pierce knows that Robert Carlyle is 
this demon, but nobody else believes him. So he's sort of having to enact his own plans in secret to try to stop him. And there's this really great push and pull. And we learn that Robert Carlyle's ultimate motivation is to convert as many people as he can to his sort of cannibalistic cult and use because this outpost is like the only place where people traveling through California can stop that they'll use it as sort of like a like a grocery store and they'll just eat certain people who come through to to sort of maintain themselves I thought that was re- uh, a really fun twist yeah they they emphasize the restorative power of eating people too where like uh, one of the big things Guy Pierce tries to catch Robert Carlyle on is his wounds in the yeah in the conference Confrontation at the cave, uh, Robert Carlyle was shot in the shoulder, and when he shows back up at the at the camp, Guy Pierce tries to tell the the other ranking members of the army, like, check his shoulder, like we shot him, he's gonna have a bullet wound, and you'll know that I'm telling the truth. And we see that the the wound is n- now totally non-existent, so that eating people actually has this completely. Uh, restorative power. It's kind of weird that I had never seen this film before because that was literally the exact theme of my senior thesis film is the restorative power of eating people. <laughs> so You if, didn't have anyone turn into demons. Though. I did not. I did not. Um, but I could see how anybody who saw that movie or that my film who had seen Ravenous would think that I just ripped it clean from from this movie, but I didn't, I swear. But it it ultimately leads to this really great fight scene at the end where Guy Pierce and Robert Carlyle are just beating the shit out of each other endlessly because they have superhuman like Wolverine-esque healing abilities and so they're just doing all of this crazy shit to each other but neither of them are dying until Guy Pierce finally catches both of them together in a, like a giant bear trap which I thought was really cool and that last scene we have Robert Carlyle saying like if you die first I'm going to eat you and then I'm going to be fine. But if I die first, will you eat me to survive? And, you know, then we finally have the resolution of Guy Pierce's cowardice, you know, his cowardly character, where at the end he decides to not eat Robert Carlyle when he dies and to just let himself die as well, which I think is a really excellent way to conclude Guy Pierce's storyline, considering that for the rest of the movie, he's a total fucking pussy and he just runs from everything. It goes full circle. There's a great character arc, especially with the story of his cowardice in the war. They talk about at length about how uh, when he was in the pile of bodies, faking dead, like his commanding officer's body was like bleeding into his mouth yeah for a long time um so there were like themes of the the cannibalism even earlier before then but it kind of comes full circle when guy pierce goes out of his way to choose not to eat Robert Carlyle. Yeah, and before that, there's a a really great scene where he confronts Robert Carlyle, and Robert Carlyle, uh, like, stabs him and mortally wounds him and takes him inside and is like, okay, uh, you can either just die or you can eat this tasty human meat that my buddy here has prepared and you'll be healed and you'll be fine. And because Guy Pierce is a, is a coward, he does eat the human meat and heal himself again for the second time. And then so to have that last time where he refuses to eat Robert Carlyle after he's died and just allow himself to die, you know, it's it's really, you know, nicely rounding out his story arc. I, I loved that. I thought it was, you know, really smart 
and uh, a great way to take his character. Uh, really satisfying, too, I think, to sort of have him be this this tragic hero. And the thing about it, too, is like, yeah, he's cowardly, but at the same time, he's also like extremely relatable because it's like you put yourself into his shoes and it's like, yeah, I'd probably do the same thing, honestly. Like... He's not a frustratingly cowardly character. It's like his his cowardice is extremely relatable, I think. Yeah, well all of his motives It's realistic, are yeah. Realistic for sure. I think I think that's something that carries pretty strongly throughout this whole film is that the characters all feel realistic you know they feel like real people even robert carlisle is this sort of like demonic superhuman yeah villain, even though you know, he's he feels like a larger person than life element to it it does feel their motivations are very clear and straightforward i guess you could say and i think that's to its benefit you know honestly. absolutely yeah and i think while there's a sense of comedic timing to a lot of the characters none of the characters feel too cliched no not at all um, which i think is important. david arquette is in this yeah. which i found kind of a weird casting choice maybe maybe one of the only things that i thought kind of weakened it just because like David Arquette is such like uh, a well, especially in the late '90s, like such a well-known goofball actor that like seeing him in this period piece in the 1800s felt a little bit out of place to me. Well, I don't think he did a bad job. '99 was like right in the middle of his uh, heavyweight title too. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, he was a <laughs> he was a big name at the time, but like he. He did feel a little bit out of place to me in this movie. I, I think he did a good job, like he sold it, but it's like, it's hard to see David Arquette and not just see David Arquette, you know what I mean? Yeah. I thought he was fine in it. No, he was fine. Like, he, he, didn't, he didn't bother me too much at all. I... Like the thing about it is like Guy Pierce, I bought him in the role because Guy Pierce is a good actor. Like Robert Carlyle, you know, I think is probably the standout in this movie. Yeah. I bought the fuck out of him. But it's, it's like you see David Arquette, and it's like, oh, it's David Arquette. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, it it's not really a, a detrimental thing. Let's talk about the score a little bit. Yeah, the score was done by a uh, gorilla's guy. Uh, Damon Albarn. Damon Albarn. Damon yeah. Albarn and Michael Nyman. Um, Who is also a very famous composer. Yeah, he's done a, a lot of, uh, you know, big movies uh, like Piano, Gattaca, um, he's done a shitload of stuff pretty big in, in the film industry. Um, but he teamed up with Damon Albarn of Gorillaz fame and Blur fame, if you're a purist, which like seeing Damon Albarn's name in the opening credits was shocking. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I would never have guessed that it was Damon Albarn if I hadn't seen his name because it's yeah. not like the score is anything like the Gorillas or Blur. It but does have a very unique style to it. Extremely. The the score is is very unique, almost out of place, but not in a bad way. It's it's definitely not the type of score that you would expect from a period piece like this, but it works really well. I think. yeah, and I think it fits the tone pretty well. Yeah, I would. I agree. I agree. It's a little tongue in cheek, while not being novelty or anything. For sure, I definitely some of the the comedic moments were helped along by the score. Like there were a few scenes where I thought specifically, like, the music that they're choosing to use in this scene is what is making it funny. If they yeah. had chosen a different score, this scene would have a totally different tone. Yeah, I think the biggest example of that is the the cave scene when they realize Robert Carlyle is the the commander, and he starts killing everyone. And the soundtrack is kind of comedic. It's corny. Yeah. It's corny. Uh, 
yeah, I no, I agree with you. Um, and and in the scene where like Guy Pierce jumps off the cliff and he's falling for like a a legitimately comedic amount of time, just like tumbling through the trees and rolling down the hill, and it just keeps going and going and going and going. And if it was quick, it wouldn't be funny. But the fact that it goes on for as long as it does, paired with the music, makes it legitimately quite hilarious. Yeah. Um, no, I thought it was very good, and I'm almost glad that they didn't go with traditional music, because I feel Same. like that would add too much of a self-seriousness to to it, to a point where I don't think it would be as effective. You know what, in a way, at times, the style of this movie kind of reminded me of, What's in that? a weird way, was uh, The Revenant. Really? Just in... Just in the the setting more than anything. I mean, sure. And uh, it, it felt much less serious than the Revenant, but like some of the survival stuff was. Yeah, I, I can see a that a bit. bit of a Revenant vibe. I I will say that I think uh, you know at certain times the the script maybe gets a little bit convoluted, like. Honestly, I was thinking about it while we were watching it. Like, why does Robert Carlyle have to take them all the way out to the cave to kill them? Like, why couldn't he just kill them at the outpost when he shows up? You know, but in in the way that they handle those set pieces and the journey and the mystery, it, I've you know, it's forgivable, I think. It it feels a bit unnecessary at times, but at the same time, motivated enough that it doesn't it doesn't like bother me with any sort of lasting effect. And you know, maybe some of that, you know, I mean, I guess the writer was the same the whole time, but maybe some of that came from you know rapid fire changing directors throughout the beginning of this production. Yeah, I, I'm sure some of that has to do with that, and like I. I wonder what the tone of this movie would have been like if it was that Macedonian art house director. Yeah. It. Because I have a feeling it would be a little more self-serious if he was directing it, which would be not good in my opinion, most likely. You know, I I don't know if I would agree that it's not good because I do, I do stand by my uh previous statement that you know by the second or third act like it's not particularly comedic anymore it does sort of take a much more serious shift to an extent that works enough that i think if the entire film was serious i don't think it would have been bad but the the way that they handled the comedic aspects in the first half of the movie worked enough that it doesn't bother me at all there's a sense of fun in the second half though that i don't know i mean if for sure in their final fight scene where they're just beating the shit out of each other and like breaking things on each other it like some of that stuff has like almost a a, a slapstick kind of vibe to it but i think i think there's definitely a tonal shift partway through the movie where they're like okay this is not as we're not trying to be as funny anymore like this is trying to be more serious yeah, that's that's a good point but, uh, you know, it works like the balance works really well. Uh, I think it I think it if if you had to go with one over the other, this movie would work as a as a straight serious film better than it would work as a straight comedic film. But they find uh, a, a really effective balance where I could still laugh at things, but I wasn't taken out of it, which I think is important. And uh, see, I don't know if I agree. I think the film works well because it has that sense of fun to it throughout. Even if it's less comedic, it still has a sense of fun that permeates it. And part of that is while the characters take themselves seriously, the world that surrounds them is kind of in a way cosmically funny, I guess you could say. 
to an extent, sure, but I think its core concept uh, is serious, and that uh, you, the the progression of the narrative in and of itself is largely serious. It's the execution where they bring out the comedy. The 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 story, the narrative itself is not intrinsically absurd. It's something that you could do a very straightforward, dark horror film about, and I think it could be successful. But it's the way that they decide to reveal the characters, to sort of introduce them, to make them interact, where that sort of absurdity comes out. And I think it's it's very successful in that. But if they had decided to go, uh, you know, very non comedic, very serious, very straightforward, it still probably, I think, would have been a successful film. I think the serious, dark aspects of it that they do are successful enough that I could see them doing the entire film that way. I think it still would have been a, a, a well done film. Um, but maybe, I, I don't, maybe, I don't have a problem. I don't I, have a problem with the comedy at all. It, it turned out. And no, no, no. I think and I don't have a problem I with that. I think a lot of the elements of it cater to the tone it went with very well. I mean, you have the, the human stew, which is just silly kind of, it's, it's over the top in in its execution. Um, you have the, the general that comes back to life. Because Robert Carlyle's character feeds him human, um, which is kind of silly. I will say one of um, the things that one of my few gripes with this movie is how quickly that character turned around. Because, yeah, we've got that reveal of a character that we thought was dead being alive because, like you said, Robert Carlyle fed him human flesh, brought him back, and sort of converted him to his cult. But all it takes is one conversation with Guy Pierce, and all of a sudden that guy's like, okay, I'm on board with you, we gotta stop Robert Carlyle, but you gotta promise you're gonna kill me first. Like, I'll help, I'll let you go. But kill me right now. And I thought that that sort of shift between that and in the scene before where he was like all on board with Robert Carlyle's scheme was a little bit jarring for me. I wish there had been a little bit more development from one end to the other. It felt drastic in kind of a bad way. In fact, that's probably one of my only gripes with this movie all around, is that I didn't buy that he would flip-flop so easily. Yeah, you know what I, I it mean? Was, it was pretty abrupt. Um, it was Yeah, it was stark. But I I didn't have too much of a problem with it and only because they didn't linger on it no, too much. I, I, the the pacing of this movie that's its saving is, grace, a, for sure. is a strong suit of it in my opinion in that it doesn't dwell on anything too long. It keeps pushing forward throughout pretty well. Yeah. I um, no, I agree 100%. I, I think that is its saving grace in that aspect, is that it doesn't give you much time to dwell on that sort of dramatic flip-flop because it continues pushing the narrative forward and you've forgotten about it pretty quick. Like, it bothered me in the moment, but, you know, 10 minutes later, I, wouldn't e I was not even well, thinking and, about and it. And the absurdity of some of its more out-there concepts are alleviated and made to feel more serious because we don't have time to linger on them too much. Sure. Um, and I think that's a really strong suit of the movie. Yeah. Um, you want to put a rating? Yeah. On, uh, sure. On I'm going to give this a four out of five. I uh, think this is a really solid movie. Like I was saying earlier, there's a great sense of fun throughout the movie um, assisted by a fantastic, really offbeat soundtrack. Robert Carlyle steals the show with a fantastic performance. It has a sense of fun that permeates the whole movie, 
And when paired with a borderline relentless pacing, it becomes a fun ride throughout the whole movie. And uh, I love the sense of comedic timing in the movie, especially in the first half. Yeah, I think for the production and the 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 uh, the problems they had in production, it's surprising that this turned out as well as it did. Yeah, I I can agree with that pretty much wholeheartedly. Uh, I I really liked this movie a lot. Uh, I loved that they're diving a little bit into the to the Wendigo myth, which, like I said before, I think is underutilized in uh, horror pop culture, especially when it comes to cannibalism. Um, the you know the setting is great, having this be a period piece. I think worked really strongly in its favor because it's you know something unorthodox. Uh, the cast is strong throughout. Uh, Robert Carlyle steals the show, though. I will absolutely agree with you. Um, really sort of eclectic score that, you know, does it a lot of good. Uh, the balance between horror and comedy is really strong as well. Um, I'm I'm also going to give it a, a four out of five. Uh, I, I think this is a, a really fun movie. Uh, solid, well-executed, well-acted, well-shot. Um, just an, an all around good movie. My minor gripes with it don't do a lot to, to hinder my enjoyment. Um, so yeah, four out of five for me for a unanimous four out of five pods for ravenous, um, a a really, really solid film. All right, so our final film of the evening is uh, a particularly special film. Um, We're going to be talking about the trauma film, Terra Firmer, directed by the great Lloyd Kaufman, um, father, god of trauma. Independent film legend as... Stated several times in the movie. This movie, uh, I guess you could say, in a way, stars Lloyd Kaufman as... Yeah, for, well, I mean, he is literally playing himself... As a blind as a director. Blind, as which, a blind director, which is which a hilarious... Is very tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. A lot of times, criticism of trauma is that they're tasteless and have no yeah. artifice to them. The last trauma film we talked about on this show was uh, way back in our very first episode about Bad Mothers when we talked about Mother's Day, directed by Lloyd Kaufman's brother, Charlie. And uh, yeah, now we're, we're coming back to trauma for those who maybe aren't familiar with the subgenre. Uh, trauma films, I guess you could kind of consider, uh, exploitation films on steroids. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty apt. Trauma films are the truest sense of outsider or exploitation or underground cinema. Absolutely. That there is. I mean, truly, truly independent, never answering to any outside studio influence, always do what they want, super tongue in cheek, super over the top, gory, gross, just generally repulsive films, not for the queasy or faint of heart, I would say. Uh, Yeah, and it's. I really respect that even though Lloyd Kaufman has gotten a lot of underground fame, he uh, still sticks to making trashy, Z-grade exploitation. Yeah, it's great. The thing about Terra Firmer is that it is probably the most self-referential trauma film that I've ever seen. 
Uh, it's extremely meta. It's a film about the making of a trauma film and murders that are happening during the production. So, you know, it's it's extremely tongue-in-cheek, very much about itself. It's, as they say, based on the, the book... Um, fuck what is that book called you've read it i haven't i've read one of the books lloyd kaufman's written he's written several movie making books at this point the one i read was uh make your own damn movie um i think this movie was based on uh one of the ones he co-wrote with uh james gunn actually yeah that's right he actually did write this with james gunn which is uh Interesting and awesome. James Gunn is a fucking fantastic filmmaker as far as I'm concerned. Well, and that's the thing. James Gunn absolutely got to start with Troma. Uh, his first feature-length film was Tromeo and Juliet. Yep. Uh, the the book that this was based on is called All I Need to Know About Filmmaking I Learned from the Toxic Avenger, okay. which was like the the Toxic Avenger was like the OG trauma film. Yeah, it's um, really what put them on the map. Yeah, and as they claim, uh, a lot of scenes and characters in this film are direct references to things that happened on trauma sets or people who were involved in the production of trauma films the the characters in this movie are are making a toxic avenger sequel one of the many sequels to toxic avenger and there's lots of references to characters that pop up in other trauma films um and like we said lloyd kaufman plays the director of the film that they're making but he's blind which is very funny yeah well the thing i always love about trauma films are while they usually follow either outcasts or weirdos or freaks. They don't talk down to them or anything because they're also made by weirdos, outcasts, yeah, and the And I think this movie emphasizes that really well. What I would say about trauma films and also about this film, like you said, um, is that it's exploitation, but it's not exploitative. A hundred percent. Yeah, I would a hundred percent agree. Because, the, think- yeah, like, like you, like you summed up so well is like trauma films take they're under no false pretenses that they're made by absolute sleazy fucking weirdos and this movie is about sleazy weirdos making a sleazy weird film and this film is in turn sleazy and weird yeah well i mean the main antagonist is someone who has a huge love for Spielberg and Spielberg movies. Yes, I loved that. He's um, just totally... I mean, we don't know he's the antagonist for a while. It's ultimately revealed that he is, but he's constantly talking about how like the films that he's actively working on are trash and that independent cinema is a joke, and that, like, Spielberg is the epitome of filmmaking and stuff like that. And then to have him turn out to be the the killer and the villain is really funny, because then our, our hero, who is a total fucking weird, sleazy scumbag, he's barely a hero, you know, is constantly talking about how great independent cinema is and being able to do what you want and that that's true cinema as pure artistic yeah. vision. I love that the uh, kind of the foil to the Spielberg love was uh, a love of Sam Fuller. Yeah. Uh, and they talk about like sh- the movie Shark, which is Sam Fuller is a, uh, you know, Jaws-esque shark movie that came out. A few years before Jaws, I believe. Um, I've seen it. It's pretty schlocky. But, like, Sam Fuller is, like, 
a huge influence to independent film because he, uh, you know, took films to extreme points at times and really put out their ideas to the forefront in movies like The Naked Kiss or Shock Corridor. But he didn't really ever get quite the acclaim that, like, uh, your Spielbergs or right. your other big directors got in states-wise. And they even talk about this in the movie. He got a lot of acclaim with French directors and French moviegoers, but that just became the butt of jokes for uh, French jokes and Jerry Lewis and all that jazz, which I thought was funny. Right, like, oh, the French are super into Jerry Lewis, so what kind of taste do they have? Yeah. Like, shit like that. Yeah, I know, it, it, it's great. Like, I, I love that kind of self-referential stuff in this movie. You know, this is a trauma film through and through. It's absolutely fucking disgusting yes it's there is so 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 gross a lot of vomit a lot of shit a lot yeah of- the the guy who's in the the porta potty that gets pushed over and then he's like unconscious and the one guy is like giving him mouth to mouth while he's all covered in shit and people vomiting, and the uh, the dude with the puppet uh, getting his his dick like stretched to <laughs> re- comically long, comically length. long, like stretching a piece of bubble gum before being cut off. Like this movie is so fucking gross. Like yeah. even somebody as desensitized as I am, like was kind of legitimately revolted a few times during this movie. Uh, like ew, 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 yeah. ew. One of the first kills dude gets a, uh, a funnel stuck up his ass. Oh my God. <laughs> the Toddster. The Toddster. Can we, can we talk about the Toddster? The Toddster might be my favorite character in this movie. He's in such a small part, but he's so quotable. He's very and has So, yeah, no, the Toddster is great. You're going to fuck Todd, and then you're going to see God. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Oh, oh man. man. No, this, there's so much good gross shit in this movie um i i will say and i think this is something we both agree on that probably because of how self-referential it is it gets unnecessarily indulgent this movie is way too long yes absolutely that's the biggest problem i have with this movie it's at least half an hour at least and I think the best example of that, the the movie itself is just over two hours long. We'll get into what I mean by that, but at one point in this movie, we cut back to the serial killer who is uh, a woman with a uh, comically overdubbed female voice that automatically like gives you an indication that there's something weird about this because of how comically overdubbed the voice is. Yeah. But at one point, we cut back to the serial killer, and when it cut to that scene, I was legitimately like, oh shit, I forgot about this character. Like I had forgotten about the main <laughs> antagonist because there was there were so many scenes in between of just the weird, gross production of this movie that they're working on, which is like fun stuff. But when you make me forget about your antagonist, that's problematic. Yeah, no, it gets sidetracked. Oh my god, so uh, hard, so much, and it felt like two different movies at times. Like the serial killer stuff. Gets Gave me hard, like, Maniac vibes, like, original Maniac, and, like, that stuff was good, and then it cuts back to the film production, and that shit goes on for so long, and it's good, too, but it's so disjointed that when it cuts back and forth between, it's like, oh, shit, I forgot that this was happening. It's, like, two different movies, and that... It's a problem. Like it, 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 it's disjointed in a way that's bad. You know, it gets too up its own asshole at, at certain points. Yes, and only the Toddster can get up its own ass. Um, <laughs> but I, I would agree. I think it gets a little too 
self-referential. Um, it's obvious that Lloyd Kaufman has a sincere love for, you know, his own movies and, like, the production and making of them. He's got a love uh, for but, the medium, for sure. Yeah, but that is kind of to its detriment at times because he's so focused on the details that, like, he's he sometimes misses the bigger picture of this is supposed to have, like, a through line Yeah, that doesn't go on too many tangents. Well, like, um, the... There's a fucking 14 minute blooper reel after the credits. Yes. Like, yeah. The which is probably the best example for this that we can give. Like, 14 minutes is too fucking long for and an I outtake mean, reel. Like, first, nobody cares about outtakes at first for that. I was long. like, awesome, because he brings in, you know, some of the, uh, the great. Troma alumni, uh, you know, he brings in Matt Stone and Trey Parker. Yeah, that was a, a nice little cameo. Uh, I thought that was really fucking funny, their little bit. And yeah, I was I was into it at first too. The the sinking feeling came when you hit the Xbox controller to see how much time was <laughs> left in the movie, and we saw that it was a 14 minute outtake reel yeah, after the credits. Yeah. Like it's it's too much. Like it's excessive. Like your fucking outtakes reel should not be any longer than five minutes at the maximum. Just leave it at the for, very leave maximum. It for the special features. Yeah, seriously. Like it's it's just so much. And the fact that the film gets so distracted that it seems to forget its own central plot about like a serial killer killing people involved with the film's production. Like that's a that's that's a problem. Yeah. You know, there's too many characters. The characters are great, legitimately hilarious, but there's so fucking many of them that it's hard to track what's happening. And then certain characters will get killed off and it's like, uh, oh, okay. Bye, I guess. You know, I mean, the kills are great. Like, the gore is awesome. You know, really fantastic uh, practical effects. Trademark trauma nastiness. And it's fun to watch, but from, like, a, a continuity standpoint, it, it gets it gets lost. It's really muddled. Yeah, a hundred percent. I will say like when it goes for the cheap jokes, it executes usually pretty well. Though. Yeah. Um, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's funny. You throughout, can, you, you for can sure. look, even look at the beginning where they do the cheap newspaper headlines or the, uh, right at the beginning, they have, a uh, a dead guy in a, uh, buried in a mound of cereal. Oh yeah, and it's they, a serial yeah, killer, and it's like that's yeah. such a dumb joke, but it's great. It's funny at the same time. Um, or uh, I another... would say I would say that the film never falters in its execution. It's just its focus that yeah. is really 100%. really lacking. Like the bits are hilarious. Like if they're standalone, like they would all be sheer gold. But it's like it feel it's one of those situations where it feels like they had too many good ideas and they crammed them all into one movie and the continuity from one bit to the next was sloppy. Yeah, I think, that, and, I think that's uh, its biggest problem. It just likes going on too many tangents. I did love Ron Jeremy as the... Uh, Ron Jeremy's the cameo was great. Molester father. Yeah. Well, let's let's get into that a little bit because I, I think that... This film has one legitimately very effective horror scene, and that is the reveal of the sound guy being the the serial killer. And he's uh, you can't even say he's a hermaphrodite who was 
castrated by Ron Jeremy's rapist father to turn him into a little girl who he could rape. And then he reveals himself to the love interest. And from an acting and execution standpoint, it's like legitimately very disturbing and creepy and weird. Very Silence of the Lambs reminiscent. Uh, Like it's sort of it's devoid of like the the characteristic bad acting of trauma like i thought that that character that actor did a really fucking good job and that you've got this weird scene where he tries to rape her and then she turns it around by raping him which is like uh, like what is this supposed to be what's happening it's like legitimately very weird and creepy and disturbing and i i i thought that was great like that was that was probably the the one moment in the film where it I thought it was legitimately engrossing like it legitimately sucked me into its world outside of like oh haha this is a fun gross trauma film I'm having a good time watching this but then that scene it's like oh shit okay so I'm in this world like I that that was legitimately extremely well executed yeah. I think just totally like viscerally gross yeah and uh you know it takes a lot of emphasis on gross out stuff throughout the movie but that scene in particular like was more disturbing than pretty much anything else oh for sure well Um, disturbing disturbing on like a psychological level outside of just being like gross out you know the the movie is full of like things that are gross and you're like ew nasty and then that scene it's like ooh, okay like this is dark and this is dark and weird and uncomfortable yeah in in a very good way and i think that's the probably the strongest sequence of the movie and it's almost kind of unfortunate that it goes back to the schlockiness after that because i feel like it kind of breaks that really good tension but at the same time that schlockiness that comes after it is still so fun and yeah. funny that it's hard to to knock it you yeah know? the whole third act is really great the way uh i guess you could say the villain is defeated um is very good yeah and you have a you know you have kind of a character arc and all these different characters right in the third act which i thought was really cool because like yeah you introduce all these characters and a lot of times they're one or two joke characters but like most of them have like arcs throughout well the yeah movie. that's the thing like even the ancillary characters like it, it they they make you pretty successfully care about these like weird sleazy gross people and in that sense i i think it's very realistic uh you know in in the way that trauma sort of is like a, a backlash against like the 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 pretty picture perfect like hollywood character like the ideal where it's like all of these people are gross disgusting people that you you feel like greasy just associating with but at the same time like you kind of care about them you know like they feel yeah. they feel like you know it's like oh this is this is a nasty person but this is somebody i know you know, and I, I think that's one of its, definitely one of its strong and, suits. And, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, I while we were watching the movie, I posed the question, is the portrayal of the hermaphrodite villain problematic in this movie? And you know what? In a normal movie, if they did the same thing, I would say yes, absolutely. But in a trauma film, I would actually say no. I think I agree with you. Because it's made by freaks, outcasts, and weirdos in the same kind of situation. And it's such a love letter to all of its characters that it never feels 
exploitative yes uh exactly in its portrayal of any of its characters because it doesn't feel like an outsider looking in right it feels like an outsider looking at another outsider no you're you're on you're on the nose like when you asked me that when we were watching the movie i i think i felt differently but after thinking about it it's like you know what no like yeah in a different film the the villainous character the hermaphrodite would definitely be problematic but considering that the whole film is made from an outcast perspective and that all of these people who are in the film are outcasts, none of the characters are, uh, you know, what you would consider quote unquote normal and i mean normal is such an arbitrary term and in this day and age you know kind of kind of a gross word because like what is normalcy but like it doesn't it doesn't feel like even though this character is the villain it doesn't feel like the film is pointing and being like oh isn't this person a weirdo look at how weird and gross and evil they are it's like no this is a misunderstood abused troubled outcast but so are all of these people well i think yeah I, I think more than anything this film emphasizes the idea of the uh the subculture of new york you know it's it's the kind of you thing like, that you could n- only get away with in a trauma niche film subcultures yeah. And I think, in a way, the internet has really killed the concept of subcultures because when everyone has access to all these different weird things, then culture is homogenized to the point where people don't have as out their identities as they used to. Yeah. You don't have, you know, punks that are, like, extreme and, like... You don't have these kind of weird subcultures that you used to in the same way. In this day and, and age, our weird subcultures are the alt right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, oh. which are who are legitimately problematic people, like legitimate scumbags. This that's one thing is like I will I will agree hundred percent. Terra Firmer could not have been made in 2018 well and that's the it's such the, a product of its time that's the interesting thing because i would say all trauma movies for like a solid 30 plus years felt like they were made in the 80s yep absolutely um, they, the uh the low budget film look of them really helps but i think it also helps because of this idea of the New York subculture of freaks, outcasts, and weirdos that they were birthed from. Yeah. And I think a lot of that gross out stuff goes hand in hand with that. I haven't seen a ton of traumas output from the 2000s uh, pre poultry geist, but I think poultry geist is a good example of the shift. Uh, to digital that occurred later on and how that subculture, that subcultural idea of having like an outsider identity has kind of started fading. And it's sad to see because uh, I think trauma is less influential than it used to be because of for that. For sure. Yeah, no, I you know, agree. I think because the idea of these niche communities has dwindled, the impact of trauma films has also dwindled in a way. I but I guess my my somewhat of a counter to that would be that something like uh like thanks killing that we've talked about on the show. You know, if it was made by trauma, it would not be out of place as a trauma film. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like in the, it's it's refreshing to see that that sort of underground indie scene still exists. Like it may not be as influential as it used to be, but like there are still active filmmakers today who are inspired by trauma and who want to 
give that sort of sleazy, indie, gross-out horror comedy uh, vibe to their films, you know, in in a in a a really good way, like. Thanks Killing is a trauma film in everything except title. Yeah. You know, you know, it's it was not a trauma production, so it's not a trauma film. But if you slapped Lloyd Kaufman's name on it, it wouldn't look out of place. Yeah. You know? 100%. So like it the 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 influence may have dwindled, but it's still there, and I think that that is uh, a, a glimmer of hope. Yeah. Uh, in, well, in I indie mean, cinema. in a way, like. Lloyd Kaufman's influences with his more recent output has dwindled, but his influence in, uh, you know, the pantheon of American filmmaking is still very strong. He, uh, you know, birthed a lot of great careers. I Like we were talking about, James Gunn. Yeah. Um, who has, you know, fucking directed two of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. And if we're lucky, we'll be rehired to direct the third and won't lose his career based off of the incoherent ramblings of a crypto fascist. But uh, like, yeah. And, and if you look at James Gunn's early output, too, like it is it is extreme. It, if not downright trauma, extremely influenced by trauma. Even if you look out, outside of something like Tromeo and Juliet and you look at like Slither, like Slither is in a lot of ways like uh, a high budget trauma film. Oh, a hundred percent. Or a higher budget. It's still relatively low budget, but like the fact that like recognizable directors have been so heavily influenced by trauma and are, you know, still willing to bring forth those influences in their work is fantastic, and I love it. In uh, a lot of ways, I would liken Lloyd Kaufman's influence to uh, Roger Corman in a lot of ways. Yes, no, I would absolutely you know, agree. I would absolutely he agree. He is a very influential figure in, uh, mostly in genre films, but he also helped bring to light a lot of really talented people that have gone on to make a lot of good things it's it's a love of the craft and a love of media of the medium uh that re- shines through more than anything else Exa- i think you're spot on with comparing him to roger corman because it's like okay yeah you consider it low budget b movies trash cinema whatever nothing that's ever going to be nominated for an academy award but it's like the the craft and the love is there you know the dedication to what they're doing it's not it's not cheap it's not corporate it's not i i mean in terms of actual budget yes it's cheap but it doesn't feel cheap it feels like somebody's artifice went into it somebody cared about what they were doing yeah it doesn't feel like a cynical cash grab it yes. feels genuine yes absolutely it's total Sincere. there's it's, a yes sense it's of complete to it. it's complete and total sincerity it's not corporate it's not a cash grab uh and i i think that that is ultimately trauma's greatest influence on film history is that you know if you have a vision you can fucking make it like you can make that shit happen no matter how weird and gross and indie it is and outside of the mainstream like if you want to do it you can fucking do it and you can be successful doing it too Lloyd Kaufman is the fucking paradigm of that of being successful from creating the weirdest grossest stupidest shit and you know still having a legitimate legacy and that is trauma and that's what makes trauma great um i'm gonna go ahead and rate this i feel like we've exhausted our our discussion on this film um I I had a lot of fun watching this movie. I think it's has a lot of great moments. I would honestly consider it almost overwhelming at times in terms of its uh ridiculousness and sleaziness and how gross it gets. Like it's kind of just like constantly assaulting your senses. You never have a break. 
And uh, I I do think it's a little self-indulgent. It's too long. It could be chopped down to a much better, much shorter movie. But uh, it's it's a wild, fun ride, and I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I think I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five pods. I am going to be in full agreement. I was actually going to give it a three and a half out of five as well. I think it is too long, uh, but it has a lot of fun ideas. You can tell there's a sense of sincerity in it in that like it's made by outsiders and weirdos and it's full of outsiders and weirdos and gross out humor and like vomit and guts and gore and uh a dude with a micro penis running around new york buck ass naked yeah and like it does it so earnestly that you can't help but enjoy it yeah you know it never feels exploitative while being gross out exploitation and schlock the story you know it gets sidetracked all the time during its narrative it. is loose at um, best but like it is still a fun story that doesn't ever get boring just because of all the different <laughs> paint that's thrown at the wall um some of it sticks some of it doesn't but it is a ride throughout I, I will say watch the credits because they're fun. The credits uh, are very fun. They they add some fun gags in the credits. But after the credits are over, watch the Trey Parker, Matt Stone, a little bit about hermaphrodites, and then you can skip the rest yeah, of the... Uh, the, the gag the, reel is uninteresting. Gag reel, yeah. So that's a three and a half for you as well? Yep. All right, well, uh, Terror Firmer gets a unanimous three and a half out of five pods. Um, I would I would definitely, despite its faults, I would call it a must-see for trauma fans. If you like trauma, this movie is definitely worth seeing for its self-reference. And before we close out our discussion on Terra Firma completely, I'm going to take us into another exciting installment of a Metacritic Corner. Now, um, Terra Firmer is uh, very low rated on Metacritic. Um, it has an average rating of 22 out of 100, which is rough. Um, but I stumbled across a uh, very funny review from a, uh, not a critic, but of course a, uh, a average Joe. I'm going to read that out for us. So, this is from John R., 1985. Troma is the worst excuse for an entertainment company in existence. Anybody who has a brain could come up with this crap. Just throw in some sex, gore, and cheesy effects, and you have a trauma film. Oh, and a storyline that has potential, but is completely drowned out. <laughs> Troma has basically been making the same film for the past 40 years. Same gore and guts, sex and nudity, and cheap gags and cheesy effects. Throw in a storyline that'll just get drowned out, and that's it. Same thing Troma has been doing for the best 40 years. Oh, and bad acting. Don't forget the bad acting. The acting is so bad that I can't even take their movies seriously. Uh, <laughs> why would you want to take a Troma film seriously? It's not, I'm not done. But their fans love them and hail Lloyd Kaufman as a god. Personally, I just can't see Troma as that good. <laughs> the way, comma, I see them, they're just a mediocre independent film company with a small cult following. And that's probably all they'll... And that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> 
This dude was so mad at this movie that he cut himself off in mid sentence. Oh, uh, zero just, out of a hundred. <laughs> he just gave up. He just gave up. <laughs> just in- <laughs> it's like fuck this. <laughs> I feel like the the person who wrote this like totally misses the point of trauma. The fact that he was so fixated on the bad acting, it's like. Uh, Yeah, that's kind of the point. Yeah, exactly. Like, he totally misses the point of all of it. Oh, my God. Fucking gold. There's nothing better than a person who gets mad about the exact reason that they shouldn't be mad about a film. Yeah. 100% (laughs) missing the point. (laughs) <laughs> That'll bring us to the end of this week's Metacritic Corner. And uh, I think that'll actually about wrap up this episode. Uh, next week... Uh, next week... We're gonna punish ourselves. Next week... For you. We're gonna be... For you. We're going to be talking about the Slenderman. That's right. That thin, thin man that you know and love. The Slenderman. His movie is out. It's in theaters. And we're going to go see it. And we're going to... We're going to talk about it on the podcast. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I, I don't know. It's going to be bad. It's going to be so rough. It's going to be so rough. It's gonna be so it'll rough. at least be funny bad. It won't be. It's going to be bad. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe I'll eat my words. I did say the same thing about the first purge, but I can see no way that this movie is going to be good in any I've capacity. I've said that about a lot of movies this year that didn't end up that bad. I thought... The new Unfriended was going to be really bad. Yeah. I thought the new Purge was going to be really bad. Who knows? But this has been a year of surprises. Maybe. And that buck will end when we see Slenderman. But maybe maybe the, maybe the Slenderman is going to be my favorite movie of 2015. This is not 2015. What? 2018. <laughs> what year am I living in? Fuck. Um, oh God. Uh, yeah, so tune in next week for our review of The Slender Man, the man who is slender. Uh, thank you as always for listening to the show. Um, be sure to uh, take a few seconds to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. Uh, if you do not already, you can follow us on social media on Twitter and Facebook at Pod People Pod. Um, if you were wondering why there wasn't an episode last week, it's because you weren't on social media. I tweeted that shit. Uh, <laughs> Um, you can also check out our letterbox page letterboxd.com slash pod people pod that's l-e-t-t-e-r-b-o-x-d uh backslash pod people pod um on there we've got a whole list of all the films we've talked about on the podcast and links to those episodes if you uh are a new listener and haven't uh checked out our backlog so uh you can follow us on there um if you want you can follow me on twitter at mr van awesome and i'm at mr sheets um and yeah you know check out what we're doing if you're into video games uh follow light arc studio on twitter and facebook we just put up a bunch of fucking bomb ass character art uh on facebook by our good buddy cleveland Mosier, who's been a guest on the show several times um check that shit out if you're into video games and be on the lookout for that um listen to ben's music on spotify uh eaten by nostalgia shit's dank um if you like the little sound bites we got on the show that's all ben um yeah i think that'll about wrap everything up you got anything else ben uh eat your vegetables 
Yeah, you know, if you're vitamin deficient, you can get some good shit out of those veggie tables. Um, thank you for joining us and our trip back to the year 1999. It was a good year overall, I think. Um, can't say that I remember it too well. Yeah. I was, uh, besides pretty... the new metal. Yeah, besides, well... <laughs> But in 1999, that shit was good. Shit was, uh, was maybe dank. some of it. Uh, <laughs> I, Limp Biscuit will never. Be Limp good. Biscuit was never good and will never be good. But uh, we'll look past that. But um, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening, and check back in next week for our review of the Slenderman. Um, until next time, I'm Matisse Van Ross. And I'm Ben Sheets. And, um... Ah! <laughs>